Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Well, Orla Carmody is an accomplished businesswoman and coach, and having spent over 25 years supporting female entrepreneurs, she has recently turned her attention to helping women enter the world of politics. Orla, I'd like to start the interview by finding out what International Women's Day means to you. Good morning, Carl. Great to be here with you. Well, I suppose International Women's Day is a great point every year, March the 8th, this this year, Monday, where we can pause and question all that we've achieved in terms of women's equality and women's progression in public and private life. And I suppose how far we've come, but we also have to look at what kind of work we still have to do. So I suppose International Women's Day came from the UN initially, and obviously the ambition is a world free from stigma and stereotypes and violence and giving women a future that's peaceful with equal rights and opportunities and all of that. And we know that that's the ideal. But what it probably really means is that we get women at every single table in the world where decisions are made because women have to make decisions for ourselves. We can't have a world where only half the population is fully represented. And, you know, when we think about women's progress or women's participation or leadership in areas, well, that drives progress for everyone. It's not about making the world just better for women. It's about making the world better for everybody. So not a lot can be done on one day, but it's a point where we stop and we pause and we look at it and we think about it again. I suppose that's the significance of it. Very well said. Now, the theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge. In your opinion, what challenge should women be choosing? Well, I think we have to really look at what challenges are open for women to choose. And I suppose that's the bigger conversation. But if we think about women's equality or women's leadership or women's participation, all of these things we've been talking about, what does that mean? Well, if you're a little girl in a third world or a developing country, it means that at the age of three, you have to go down to the well and carry the water while your brothers are sitting around or allowed to be educated and you're working from a very young, young age. So that little girl hit inequality at the age of three. In our world, you know, young women don't hit inequality until much later. And maybe that's the kind of measure of progress. How how far can we push that back before our young women hit it? So my daughter is 22 and she's studying in Trinity College and she will tell me, you know, all through primary school, all through secondary school, she never, ever, ever encountered anything that made her think she was unequal or lived in an, equal wor- in an unequal world. But then, you know, she's white, middle class, privileged. I get all of that. But the point is, she started going out and about then at about 18 or 19, and she lands into nightclubs. And the next thing is, she's groped. And she has to stop and say, what is it about our world that young lads out there, out and about, same as myself, think because it's a crowded nightclub, they're entitled to grope me. (laughs) And that is her first time of hitting that inequality. And she had to learn to speak up for herself and say, back off, don't you dare do that again, you know. Uh, What sort of a person do you think you are, et cetera, et cetera. So that's maybe in our civilization. and, And that really is what we have to look at is why do we have a world that is still unequal, where women maybe are more nervous about walking home, where they're challenged by what they wear, where they're challenged by what they say or what they do. Women in public life, politicians, female politicians will tell you, for example, that they are trolled on social media much, much more than male politicians ever are. And it's very personal. They're challenged by what they wear, how they look, what colour their lipstick is, what they, what their hairstyle is like. And again, why are these things relevant? You know, they should not be relevant. We should be judging women in public life for what they say and what they do. And on that very topic, since you last joined me on Business Matters, I know that you've been coaching women who are considering entering the world of politics. But why did you decide to pursue this particular path? Well, I've been a journalist myself and a communicator all my life. And then I moved into the area of executive development and training and coaching. So I'm now a coach in terms of I will coach anybody who needs to set their goals and and work out what it was they want to achieve in life. But yes, I've always always worked with women. I've always wanted to encourage women to go forward. And one of the, the jobs I've done for many years now is I've worked for Women for Election. And as you know, Women for Election was founded to see could we redress this balance, this imbalance in terms of 
of women in political life in Ireland. The reality is what will persuade a woman to go forward for, for political life in Ireland? It's resilience, it's confidence, it's developing their skill at public speaking, at doing media interviews. It's really finding all of the things they've done in their past life as transferable skills because really what are the skills of being a politician when you have to look at events you organised or things you trip participated in or did you campaign not to have the, the pylons go across your back field or did you c- campaign to have the extension put on the school or did you campaign for for your disabled child these are amazing skills that people and women can learn to access and transfer into public life so I work with Women for Election on the training side of things actually training women who are considering running for politics and they come on a programme called Inspire and they start thinking about you know what maybe I could do this and I actually could make a difference. So Orla, what process do you bring them through on that Inspire programme? Well, it's online at the moment. Back in the day, we used to have do these lovely, intense weekend workshops where, you know, it would be a campaign school. But now it's, uh, it's online. So there's about four different sessions they do. The first one is on, on resilience and confidence. The next one is on communicating. The next one is on building a team and understanding how constituencies work and how, you know, getting uh, selected is going to work for you. So, as I said, I'm just one of a number of external trainers who Women for Election um, uh, hire to do these these tasks. But I've worked with them for, for 10 years since, since Women for Election was set up. So I'm, I'm very, very passionate about it. And of course, Orla, we've heard much debate about gender quotas. Are you in favour of gender quotas as a means of increasing female participation rates in politics? Personally, I am. I understand people who are not uh, in favour of gender quotas. They think everybody should compete on, on a level, you know, they should compete on a level playing field. And I do agree. But I think we have to level the playing field in order that we can compete. And I, I am in favour of what I would describe as quotas with the horizon. We put quotas in place up to a, a defined point. And when we've got the, the, the playing pitch a little bit more level, then we can remove those quotas again. But I think we need them currently. But I think more importantly, even than things like quotas, I think we really need to do a lot of work with our young women. We need to get young women aware that they have a voice, that they need to express themselves, that they need to know their mind, they need to know what they want in life and, and where they can contribute most positively. And a project I've come across recently that I'm, I'm fascinated by and I'm just uh, talking to them about, about a more kind of a formal engagement with them, but it's called Shona.ie and it is a wonderful, wonderful leadership piece for young women. They run workshops in schools. They have great online resources for young women. The ethos is all about diversity and inclusion, respect for yourself, learning and development, anti-bullying. But anyway, the Shona Project, if anybody is listening who has any young woman in their life at school or college age, uh, they should go online on Monday, uh, the 8th to the 10th of March, 8, 9, 10. It's the Shine Festival. It's a big online festival. There's about 80 women speakers. Uh, you can plug in and out of it any time throughout your school or college day. There's speakers on leadership, on health and resilience. And I just love that idea of letting young women start engaging with this whole process of developing their consciousness, developing their awareness, developing their own voice. Yeah, it's a fantastic initiative. Now, as Gavin Duffy's wife, do you harbour any political aspirations yourself or would you consider following in your husband's footsteps in running for president in 2025? I don't honestly think it's something I'll do myself at this stage of the game. No, I'm really committed to my work, which is in, as I said, executive coaching these days and leadership development. And I work with such a range of people and companies and businesses. And I really feel that my talent and my skill is being in being strategic and working with these organizations and individuals in finding what their goals are and what the direction uh, they want to do is. One of the projects I'm, I'm currently working on is for um, Age Friendly Ireland. I'm a business consultant to Age Friendly Ireland. And obviously, we know our demographic is aging hugely at the moment. So there's about 1 million people in Ireland over the age of 60 right now. That will have doubled to 2 million by 2050. So that's brilliant news. My own mother is 90 and she's fabulous. She's a force of nature and she's in great form. Um, We're keeping younger, healthier, longer. But at the same time, I'm tasked with my role with Age Friendly Ireland is to encourage businesses to be more age friendly, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because there's a good return on investment. If you become age friendly and you signal to this growing demographic 
that you're open for business, that you value their business, you welcome them, you know, there's going to be a good, strong return on investment for you. And, you know, this demographic, the older demographic, we're healthier longer, we're living in our homes longer. Older people control, uh, I think it's 50% of all consumer spending in, in the European Union. And yet only 10% of all marketing is directed at that older age cohort. Now, over the past six years, you've written two very different books. Firstly, I'd like to discuss Perform as a Leader. What can readers take from that particular book? Well, that book was kind of capturing all of the, the kind of the learning and the teaching I've done over the years. I'm, I'm 20, 30 years at this game and I've learned an awful lot about how we perform as leaders. And that, to my mind, communication is at the heart of, of being a good leader. You might have the most brilliant ideas in the world. You might have the great concepts. You might have, you know, all of the money backing you. But if you can't pull your team around, you get them with you, get them aligned, move them forward with you, you're not going to succeed. And that's all down to communication. So if you're like a small startup business or a big uh, team leader in a very big organization, you have to be able to coach your teams to come with you. You have to be able to pitch your idea. You have to be able to present your idea. You have to be able to negotiate. So I kind of captured a lot of learning over the years and I had a chapter on each one of those things, how to pitch, how to present, how to coach, how to negotiate, how to lead teams, how to, and really even looking into where leadership comes from and is it a kind of an intrinsic quality or is it an extrinsic quality? Can you learn it? Can anybody become a leader? I really wanted to investigate all of that. So the book came out, it's four or five years ago now, still sells very well. Um, It's a real sort of a shelf book. It's not the kind of a book you would read in a sitting probably. It's more, I have to do that pitch next week, take down that book and read that chapter again. And then in 2018, you collaborated with many well-known names to publish the more personally inspired book, Without You, Living With Loss. What prompted the idea for this particular book and what impact did it have on you when you were compiling it? Yeah, well, and funnily enough, it's very topical again now with COVID, obviously, when so many people have suffered uh, bereavement and, and great loss. But when you mentioned I married to Gavin Duffy, he of the Dragon's Den fame, and when I married Gavin, I had been a widow. I'd been widowed very, very young. My first husband, Kieran, passed away in his early 30s. I, I was only in my 20s at the time. We were, we were children when I look back at it now. But he had suffered a brain tumour and, and passed away after a number of years. And he was cared for in the hospice in Harold's Cross to Dublin. And I always wanted to come back to that and do something for them, do a fundraiser for them, because I had, it was such a formative part of my life. And I just remembered them so fondly and I wanted to do something. So I went back to them and came up with this idea to uh, bring out this book, Without You Living With Loss. I edited it myself. It's still on sale in, in the hospice in Harold's Cross. And I asked a load of well-known people to write a letter directly to the person they had lost, telling them how they're getting on now a number of years later and the people who wrote it the letters for me at first they said oh my god that's a weird thing to do write a letter to my my mother who's gone or my husband or my child or whoever I've lost and yet every one of them when they came back to me said thanks for making me do that that is the most therapeutic thing I've ever done and we captured all these lovely letters beautiful beautiful letters and we put it in this book and it was on sale uh, on behalf of the fund- fully uh, fundraising for the, for the hospice. And they still have it on their website and it still sells quite well. Um, it was a hard thing to do for me, but it was a hard thing, as I said, for each of the writers to do it. But they did a, such a beautiful job and every one of them, as I said, said it was something very meaningful to them afterwards. And some very heartwarming stories in that book, I have to say. Now, of course, COVID-19 has caused untold disruption, but with a glimmer of hope on the way with the vaccine rollout, how should business owners be preparing for the recovery now? Well, I think every business is different and they have to prepare in their own way. But I think all of us have found this period in the last year to be so, so difficult. We've seen businesses close. We've seen restaurants and pubs and the hospitality sector suffer. Um, I, I said I do a lot of consultancy work for Age Friendly Ireland and one of the things I do with them is an online training program and I've had every manner of business on that training program that I'm, I'm giving uh, uh, by Zoom over the, over the last while and listening to how they're trying to plan to reopen and yet they're, they're behind closed doors and the shutters are down and the lights are off and they're trying to keep staff motivated and keep planning. But one of the, the a project like achieving their age-friendly status and getting their charter has been useful because it's given the team something to look forward to, to motivate them to start planning for so that when they open up, they will have these 
changes in place that will show the world that they're very age friendly and it's a good time to do it because they can do it behind closed doors for now but you know you have restaurants so frustrated and I mean some of them obviously selling coffees outside the door or sandwiches or something to try and just keep some bit of tick over business going or doing uh, home deliveries and then you have you know the hotels you know doing a lot of work in terms of um, even refurbishing and all of that going on behind the scenes but it is so so hard for businesses and I think maybe we haven't seen as much direction from government as we could have done I think that they're the the current government is really lacking in cohesion and I think they need to stop leaking things and stop publicly spatting and and actually give us more direction and more leadership. I think that's terribly important and I think the business community need the supports that are in place. They need to be sustained for longer and I know we're beginning to hear about oh the billions in debt the country is racking up but you know we will turn around. It's not like the uh, recession of 2008 where you know the world collapsed because of the property thing we will recover quickly this time I'm, I'm confirmly of the view we will recover quickly but we just need to hold our nerve and and get that vaccine rolled out and if the government could just get the logistics in place and get that vaccine rolled out faster that's what they need to do and let us all get back to work safely here here now Orla finally as we face into International Women's Day 2021 if there are any aspiring female entrepreneurs listening to this morning's programme what advice do you have for them as they embark on this journey? Well, I would say to anybody starting out right now, you're the bravest person in the world. I love you already. <laughs> to be starting out <laughs> at this time takes some energy and some vision and some direction, and that is absolutely wonderful. Um, having said that, I would say, look, get all the supports that are available to you. Go to your local enterprise office. They're absolutely fabulous. They will give you supports. I mean, I know they're flat out trying to deal with, you know, businesses that are closed at the moment and trying to give us the, the continuity vouchers and the, the online trading vouchers and all of that. But at the same time, they're great people. They're there to help you get the support. Do a start your own business course. Try and get on one of the new frontiers programs that some of the um, the IT colleges have. Brilliant program, six months I think they pay about 15000 as a support to you while you're on it and you get so much mentoring and support as you go along. I've trained on those programmes and met fabulous business people on them. There's a wonderful programme um, in the DCU Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, again, a support programme. Usually what uh, somebody starting out needs is a peer group and a mentor and people who've been down that road before you. And the best way to get into one of those communities like that is to try and get in on one of those programmes, one of those accelerator or development programmes because you get the, the, the support from the peers, you get the support from the mentors, you get the direction, you get somebody to look at your business plan, to look at your marketing plan. You need a sense check. You really need to sense check your idea. It's wonderful to be that entrepreneur who is single-minded and driven and absolutely knows this widget is going to change the world. But at the same time, you have to have somebody who will sense check that along the way for you and give you honest feedback. So find a mentor, find a coach, find a program to get involved in is what I would say. Well, Orla Carmody, many thanks for joining us on this morning's show. It's been inspirational as always, and I wish yourself and Gavin every continued success. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.